Well, tomorrow's Earth Day. Did you know that? I did know that. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a big enviro, and I love Earth Day. Yeah, and here to talk about endangered animals from the San Diego Zoo is Rick Schwartz. The handsome. Hi. Give that one in a second. Yeah. Hi. Hi, good to see you guys. It's great to see you too. This is Winnie. She's Winnie. an African penguin, and Hi. we have her friend Lily. Who's... Should I? Is this okay if yeah. I do this? Right well, here on the back. Yeah, That's right the, the, the side back. that doesn't bite. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the so side that doesn't bite. I have to say right off the bat, zoos work together in conservation across the nation, and these two penguins we have here today. <laughs> These guys are from the Maryland Zoo. The Maryland Zoo was nice enough to partner with us today because they're one of the founding organizations to bring African penguins to America, but also create a founding population. So what's happening with African penguins is they're losing a lot of habitat, yeah. and so they need a lot of help. But anyhow, the African penguins, a lot of people don't realize, they are warm-weathered penguins. Right. So for them to live in warm weather, they have a couple cool adaptations. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. You can get <laughs> yeah. this one. Yeah, no, Come here, worry. Lily. Let's get you on here, too. What Hi, could sweetheart. possibly go wrong? Exactly. <laughs> like, what, what do these things eat before? They we... eat fish, so when they go to the bathroom, it really stinks. Well, like I said, this is an African okay. species, so they're found in South Africa and so the southwest coast of Africa. They are in warm weather, so you see these pink patches above the mm -hmm. eyes. That's how they help regulate heat. They'll radiate heat out that way. You see the grooves in the beak there. The beak actually works like a rudder when they're swimming in the water, so it's really cool how these guys can get along really they're well. amazing swimmers, right? 12 miles an hour. Wow. Which doesn't seem like much, but you think Michael Phelps didn't even hit like seven miles an hour at his right. fastest. So 12 right. miles an hour underwater for a sustained period of time is pretty fast. Yeah. These guys are actually having a lot of challenges, and what zoos are doing is we're creating different ways that we can track where they are, mm -hmm. who's in the colony, and also then how to make nest boxes for them, because it's kind of gross. Yeah. Their nesting area is in guano. You know what guano is, right? Yes, yeah, their poop. That's poop. Poop, poop, poop. Think poop. <laughs> it's true. You I, see, I like, wasn't yeah, going to say anything, but... Um, yeah. So they make sort of a den out of that at guano. It works like adobe. It keeps the nest right. at a perfect temperature, whether it's too hot outside or cool at night. Mm -hmm. That adobe sort of guano den helps keep that nest area at the perfect temperature. The guano is being harvested, though, for farmland because it's great fertilizer, high in nitrogen, rich in a lot of different things. And so what's happening is they're losing their nesting sites. So zoos are creating nests that we can put out in the wild for them and help them balance out their population numbers. And, and do they mate for life? That is a... Yes, they are monogamous to a certain degree. <laughs> <laughs> they they will they they're monogamous yeah uh, <laughs> kind of like, like Hollywood so yeah, they're, yeah right so they'll they'll house together they'll show up for functions together yeah. but there might be someone on the side for every now and then yeah. but it, but it helps keep gene, the genes diverse so it's very important but yes. we got another really cool endangered species okay Lily really, you go should on I off put that this way. one down I'll take this okay. one here okay so you had mentioned in the tease about Girl, you the, got a lot more guts than I do about uh, the Panama Panamanian golden frog this the golden frog and see <laughs> as much as you're being silly about it. It's actually really important for the Panamanian people, kind of like the bald eagle is for us. Yeah. Now these are, um, you've heard of poison arrow frogs or poison yeah. dart frogs. So they're, yeah, you can, yeah, they're, they are a little poisonous, but you can touch them. You can touch them? I'm, I, I have to hold on to them. Okay. If you feel dizzy, it's completely normal. No, I'm kidding. They in feel the, so good. They do. In the wild, I'm because cool, of though. what they eat. Try it. Just try it. Just try it. Come on. Well, says, live live little, I'm kidding. So in the wild, with what they eat, woo, with what they eat, <laughs> Makes them poisonous. They just excrete it in the skin. But at the zoo environment, we feed them with regular insects so they don't. Have, oh, so have they're that. not poisonous. Right, exactly. But this is what's so important about being here right now. Uh, Earth Day is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. These are extinct in the wild. Oh. As in, you go oh. to their home rangeland, there are no more in the wild. Oh. The Panamanian government and zoos like the Maryland Zoo, who we partnered with, and San Diego Zoo also have breeding colonies. And we're hoping once we get certain diseases and fungus under control, they can be reintroduced back into the wild. Oh, this will be I very hope important. So. For yes, them. yes, 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 yes. They're so cute. I they love them cute. so they much. What beautiful colors, yes. too. So what else do we have now? We have a beautiful green uh, iguana. Oh, iguanas now are the, amazing. The green iguana. The green iguana. Can I touch? Is, yes, please do. Yes. Is abundant. There's more than we know what to do with. In fact, people who keep them as pets will release them out in the wild, and they become a problem for other animals. What do they eat before I touch this thing? They they eat like apples. Yeah, apple slices, leafy greens. It's all leafy veggies, greens. man. All vegetarian. Let's be vegetarian. Like vegetarian. vegetarian. He's looking at me, yeah, though. Like, you're looking at him. Like, what you looking at him? He's got like an attitude, though. Yeah, put, your, put your hand out like this. Okay. Put your hand out like this. There you go. Okay. Oh. You're good. You got it. Nice, nice and gentle. You got it. There you yeah, go. You got it. You got it. You got it. So, nice breath. Take a breath. Take a breath. There you go. Very good. All right. You're good. You're good. Now, so Kelly, do, you get a turn. So, do they make good pets? 
Well, they, they can my, be very my challenging. My wouldn't do no better. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> they can be very challenging as pets, and so that's why sometimes people end up re-releasing them. But the cool thing is that with this iguana here today, we can talk about. He the... loves you, Van. He He's loves still looking you. at me, man. He's like looking at me. But you're looking at him. I'm trying not to. I'm doing this. <laughs> He's really sweet. They are very sweet, yes. And what's really important, the message I want to bring to these guys with the green iguana is zoos are working with the Fijian iguanas and other species of iguanas which are critically endangered in the wild. The green iguana is a great messenger for that story, though, because people releasing them back in the wild actually impacts other iguana species. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so oh, it can be a I bit see. of a challenge. But yes. some cool adaptations, these crazy long toes you see here. Yeah. touched you and you survived. Yes. <laughs> yeah. These are great for climbing in the trees. Green, green iguanas sometimes are referred to as the chicken of the tree. The chicken of the tree. Because they're quite abundant in Central America and they live up in the trees and people actually harvest them as food. Oh, I didn't yeah, know. Kind of weird, huh? Hey, uh, coming up, we're going to uh, an animal that's going to help us curb Lyme disease. More with Rick Schwartz from the San Diego Zoo. Hey, hi. You're back with Rick uh, Schwartz from the San better? Diego Zoo. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah, that's that's more in the domain of stuff. You know, the turtles and stuff. Right. This is this is a California desert tortoise, yeah, and no, 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 no. a lot of people are quite accustomed to seeing them. But yeah. in the wild, they are facing so many challenges right now. And the cool thing is, is zoos across America, along with several universities, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, using camera traps. We can actually place a GPS device on them, find out what their needs are in the wild so we can better take care of the wilds where they're found oh, throughout idea. the desert southwest. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of people I know and a lot of people I've met that do this kind of work, and it's labor intensive. It's a lot of work to make sure these guys are doing all right in the wild. But what the, is their biggest challenge? What is, do, do you find? Oh, my goodness. Well, of course, you know, as humans, we need land to develop things and do things. Right. And so we just need to maybe do it a little better, a little bit different. It's mm -hmm. not a matter of not doing it. It's just yeah. finding sustainable ways of doing it. That, as too, as humans move into the area, we bring things like, like coyotes that might not be normally in that area or ravens or seagulls that come right. in and eat from the dump and they like to eat their babies. Yeah, so when they hatch, right. out, hatch out, they're really small. So those are challenges we're facing. So Head Start programs are really important. Zoos are doing those for a lot of species where we basically raise the babies in the zoo environment and then send them back out once they're old enough not to be preyed upon. He's so cute. They are cute. And this guy here is, is really impressive. This shell people sometimes think is um, calcium, like a clam shell or mm -hmm. a lobster. It's actually carapace or keratin, just like your fingernails. Oh. So they can actually feel you guys touching them as part of their body. It's he not can... something they can hop out of like the cartoons have you believe. So does he like this or are we torturing him? No, I, I, yeah. trust me, this guy's yeah. been doing educational programs his entire life, so yeah. he's quite used how, to this. How old is he? He looks like he's like a We don't know for old. sure. We believe he's probably in his 30s or 40s. They can live upwards to 80. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty impressive. So we'll hand stuff. this one off here. So cute. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Van's having a hard time today. Yeah. I'm sorry, Van. Is I it a love... possum or opossum? This Which is it. Okay, so truth... is it a rat or a rat? <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, this is a North American Attention. opossum. Please do yes. This is a North oh, American so opossum. The word opossum is what we've shortened to call them, but there is true species called possum in New Zealand, uh, New Guinea, and Australia that are critically endangered, and they're cousins of this animal. This is the only true marsupial we have in the North American area, but why are why is it important to save animals aside from their cute and fluffy? Well, here's a great clue. Fluffy. You can right. fluffy. They're fluffy, right? Yeah. You might not think cute, but fluffy. Okay, fair it's enough. It's really soft. Do you want to touch no, it? No, that's fine. Okay. The North American opossum right here in front of you has a huge impact on our lives. I don't know if you heard the news recently coming out for this spring is that Lyme disease is on the rise in North mm -hmm. America, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a big issue this next couple of years. Yeah. Already a big issue for those who have it. Yeah. This animal here, as they walk along the floor of the forest or your neighborhood or wherever in the night, they pick up 50 to 100 ticks every day. Really? You know what they do then? Turn around and eat them. Wow. And Lyme disease doesn't affect them. So sometimes we don't always realize how important it is to save species until we realize the job they have in the wild yeah. is very how important. How about as well. that? Good tick yeah. magnet. So I'm going to yeah. go ahead and put this one over here. Does he have any ticks on him right now? I'm going to have you guys shift over just a little bit. Okay. This animal coming out, we are oh. not going to pet. Oh. <laughs> this is an African serval. This is Savannah. She's a full grown adult serval. Now, sometimes people see servals and they think they are a cheetah. Clearly, yeah. Much smaller than a cheetah. We had a cheetah on the show a couple years ago. We sure did. Now, this is an important cat because although they're stable in the wild, their numbers are doing really well, the savannas in which they share with other animals like the giraffe yeah. are facing major problems we never realized. In fact, giraffe population has dropped by 40% in just the last few years. So right now, we look at the African serval and these adaptations. The nickname giraffe cat fits very well. They survive very well in the wild as well. But we have to keep in mind that just because animals are doing well right now doesn't mean they'll be stable in the future. Right.
Um, and they're guys, mistaken for cheetahs a lot, right? Because of the striped pattern. The if you saw, yes, if you saw At a distance, the, maybe. the uh, cheetah next one, you'd see that they are, are much, much smaller. He than looks like he's still hungry, and we yeah, have I know. guests here. Well, of course. Because <laughs> <He's laughs> it's a carnivore. More food so, food. so, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, this position right here is perfect. You can see those giant ears. Looks like it needs to grow into their ears. It looks like something happened to the tail on the other end. Yeah. The ears they use for listening for birds flying towards them. From this position right here, she could easily leap up 10 feet and grab a bird out of the air to is, feed herself. Is that enough of a leash? Well, we're not going to do the leaping right now. There's no birds flying through. I'm just yeah. saying in this position, that's what they would do. And that short tail is also there because they don't need a long one. A long one is for balance and because their positioning in life is to leap and pounce straight up right. or over, a long tail would simply get in the way. And the ears, are those to make predators think that they're bigger than they are? The, well, the, the white spots, yes. Yeah. See, you, I, that's why I love working with Kelly. She knows so much about animals. Hey, the white spots me. in the back of the ears, <laughs> the white spots in the back of the ears are referred to as false eyes. So at a distance, another serval or predator might think that she's looking back them, so like, oh, I'm going to circle around and sneak up on her, which of course it would give up their location. Wow. And then of course the the babies could listen to those ears as well. Is she hissing at us? She's just saying hi. It's also okay. a little stock. Hey. <laughs> Rick, thank you so much. You're thank doing you. such incredible work. Appreciate we really it. appreciate it. Thank Thanks you so much. Very, very good. Thank you, Kelly. Rick Schwartz, everybody. He's really the best. Make sure you go to see the San Diego Zoo in person.